the uneducated economist here so i'm going to do this live stream on my lunch so i only have about an hour we'll give it maybe 45 50 minutes here uh to talk on this live stream um over the last two days uh three days i've put out a couple of videos um like a three-part series little mini series that i have done not too much unlike the rest of the information that i put out on a regular basis but um we were talking about like kind of in a nutshell what's going on in the economy you know i broke down how money is kind of put into the system through the quantitative easing and then removed through the quantitative tightening we talked about interest rates and then we talked about the supply chain right now i think the supply chain is the biggest story right that that needs to be told like everything is going to come down to whether or not people are going to be able to get their items and things that they've made, their services, whatever it is, trying to get that through the supply chain is going to be very difficult. And you're starting to find where the overwhelming consumer demand has evaporated. It's gone, right? And the overwhelming consumer demand that went into the items for transportation, you can see it like through the freighters, through the trucking, through all the distribution network, you can see where this overwhelming consumer demand that's grabbed all these items and started throwing it through the system as it got clogged up and the demand increased because these items weren't getting through. And if you don't have anything on the shelf, you start increasing more and more orders for it. That backlog eventually starts finding its way through. Well, during that time, the demand for trucking, the demand for rails, demand for containers, demand for all that stuff was through the roof and it just disappeared it's gone and now you got chips that are sitting idle you got truckers who are going out of business you got like i think they said there was something less than a dozen ships sitting off of the port of la that that whole thing has just completely come to a standstill right as far as how overwhelming comparative i shouldn't say it's a standstill comparatively to what it was to what it is today it's like completely opposite realms now, I think the biggest issue that we really need to look at is what's going on in China right now. If you look at their manufacturers, they are in a bad place. And as far as slowdown goes, their zero COVID policy has pretty much wiped out their manufacturing base, at least to the to the level that it once was. It's just not the same thing like it once used to be. And this is going to create a problem going into the future because you have to think like if there's nobody manufacturing right now, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to all the stuff that we normally buy from China if it's not being made right now? It's going to really be gone. See, we had these shortages that everybody experienced, and they're like, oh my gosh, there's huge shortages within the economy. There was no shortages. It was a backlog. It was sitting in containers. It was sitting at ports. It was sitting on ships. It was not getting through the distribution. And there was no shortage. It just wasn't to the place that people needed it to buy. That's not a shortage. That's a backlog. What we're about ready to experience if they are not manufacturing is a real shortage. Like there won't be anything to buy. It's not like backlog or sitting on ships. It's just not made. And that is going to be a very difficult place for all of us to be in considering what? That nobody's preparing themselves for it at all. So this is part of the Cantillon effect. And I really honestly believe that the powers that be out there, if there was an elitist group that is trying to control the world, it's just a handful of people who are really like the, the powers of everything. If you were to think about it from the Cantillon effect, when you have new money coming into the system and that new money starts driving out the, ex, the, the domestic manufacturing and starts driving in foreign imports, if that continues, eventually the state that is bringing in that new money eventually becomes reliant on the foreign imports and then once those foreign imports turn off or the money the new money turns off and the foreign imports stop, stop coming in everybody falls into poverty okay so you think about what happened in the united states back in the late 50s 60s we were a manufacturing powerhouse right we produced more and sold more to the rest of the world then we lent more money to the rest of the world as well so we were not only the biggest like producer but we were also the biggest lender of, of pretty much everything out there. Now, we are the biggest consumer, we import more than anybody, and we're the biggest debtor nation in the entire world, completely opposite of what we once were. Well, if you think about it, when we were a manufacturing powerhouse, that was new money coming in. We were exporting our stuff 
and bringing in new money. As we brought this new money in, the people started raising their standard of living. And as they were enjoying this new money and the higher standard of living, they did not want to spend that money on higher items, higher priced items. So they started importing the foreign goods. That importing of foreign goods started competing with the do domestic manufacturers. As more money started pouring in, the new money pouring in, ever increasing amounts of the foreign imports came in until eventually the United States became reliant on the foreign imports, much like we are now. So think about China right now. They're a manufacturing powerhouse, very much like what the United States used to be back in the 60s. So it seems to me like right now, the United States is trying, they're not doing it very successfully because the dollar is growing stronger, but they were trying to stop the amount of exports coming, well, what is it, imports coming in and trying to increase the amount of exports going out of the United States. They were trying to reverse what was happening. Same thing in China. They were trying to slow down the manufacturing over there and try and slow down the amount of exports getting out of the country. If you think about it from the Cantillon effect, right, it doesn't make sense like intuitively, right? Why wouldn't you want to make money by manufacturing stuff? But if that new money is pouring into the system and it is driving the standard of living into luxuries, eventually that driving into luxuries will drive out your domestic manufacturers, drive in the foreign imports, and eventually drive everybody into poverty. So, Okay. Woo! Babel Dono, good one about that one. Thank you, Osama, for the $5. I really appreciate it. Yep, token of my appreciation and all I've garner, garnered from your channel. Well, I really appreciate that, Osama. I do. Thank you. Hey, UE, did you hear about the Mississippi River being way lower than usual and clogging up New Orleans ports? Shipping costs up 2,000% and companies clogging up trucks, trains, looking for alternatives. Yes, I did hear about that. And again, that is like kind of in a... Oh. Oops, sorry, guys. That... It's getting hot in here. That is in an isolated area, although it's a major port and functioning. It's not the entire economy that is experiencing that. It's just kind of in that particular area. And although that is a, very impactful, I would imagine that at some point that's eventually going to change, right? I mean, I would think that eventually the water will start to rise again and then the flowing of merchandise will start to happen again. But at this point, it's very, you know, it's very difficult. And yes, it's going to have an impact on, on you know, at least on that particular region of it. But I try to think of things that are not isolated, even though that's a major one, but things that are more like broad to the macro level of things like everybody experiences this, not just the people who are isolated to that particular area. All right. Uh, Richard, thank you for the four ninety nine. Very kind of you. What does it mean when you say 500 per thousand when you're referring to lumber prices? What does thousand refer to specifically? Okay, uh, that's a really good question. Um, what they're referring to is is per thousand board feet. And board foot is 144 cubic inches, however you want to figure that out. So typically, most people would think think of a board foot as being one inch by 12 inches by 12 inches. That would be one board foot. And so when you say 500 per thousand, you're talking $500 per thousand board feet. So when you're talking like big numbers, you really have to break it down because nobody's going to talk about like an individual lineal foot or one board foot. You break it into thousands to make it, you know, when you're dealing with bulk pricing and stuff like that. So to kind of give you an example, a two by four, eight standard and better, very common piece of lumber, like your standard stud in the wall, two inches by four inches by 96 inches. That works out to, was it 5.33 board feet per eight footer, right? So that's if you can kind of understand, you know, how that works. So 500 per thousand means $500 per thousand board feet of lumber that's how they generally figure it out. If you wanted to know how much that two by four is, you take 5.33 times that by 0 0.500 for the 500 per thousand, and that'll give you your cost per, per two by four. Um, and that's on the futures market. Now, obviously, when you're looking at the futures price or the cash price from the mills, you also got to include like transportation costs, storage fees, uh, profits for the retail, all that stuff goes into it. So it's not like, you know, you see the 500 per thousand at the futures price and you're saying, how come the retail charges, you know, 30, 40% more than that. It's not because they're paying that 500 per thousand, the retail, by the time it gets to them, they're paying a lot, lot more than 500 per thousand. But on the futures price, when you're buying the truckload price, because I think they, they used to have uh, futures contracts at 110,000 board feet. I think now they have them like at a quarter of the size. Um, 
if I remember right, I think they started doing contracts on a, on a much smaller scale. Um, but then if I was listening to Keta right, she was, uh, Keta is the owner of uh, Madison Lumber's report, incredibly knowledgeable when it comes to lumber. If you're looking to get some lumber information, follow Keta at Madison Lumber's report. Very, very informative. But if I remember right, she was saying that although the contracts have been busted down to a quarter of the size of what they used to be, you still have to buy them four at a time. That doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, that's per thousand. All right. Stimulate the like. Yeah, please hit that like button. I'm going to be out here for probably about another half an hour or so. I'm just on my lunch break right now and thought it would be fun to kind of talk about the last few videos that we have done and talk about the supply chain breakdown that's obviously taking place. You know, it's funny because old Jerome Powell, right, he came out there saying that they're looking for help from the supply side. And with the moment that he said that, I told, I said it on my channel, it will not work. It will not work there's going to be no help coming from the supply side if the federal reserve is going to continue to raise interest rates there is no incentive from the supply side if you're a manufacturer a retailer a distributor a transportation whatever it is it doesn't matter if you are in, under the impression that you are going to be put into an environment in which your customer is going to feel pain then why would you try to expand your business? Why would you even try to like, you know, be encouraged to think this is going to be a, a good environment? You would be hunkering down, right? You would be taking on less investment. You wouldn't be hiring people. You wouldn't be doing new equipment. You wouldn't be doing any of that stuff because you're worried about the fact that there's not going to be a consumer out there to get your business moving. So it's not going to work. The, the help from the supply side is not coming to the Fed. That's why the interest rates aren't going to come down because they're not going to get help from them people. Right? And the idea of raising interest rates to slow the consumer down is going to do very little to actually slowing the consumer down as much as it's going to actually cause the rise of unemployment. I think that's probably the bigger picture is that they really want to take out some of these uh, zombie corporations that have pretty much gorged on the incredibly cheap debt during the pandemic when interest rates were brought to zero and everybody started rushing into corporate debt. This is where the Federal Reserve was able to keep the unemployment at the historically low levels is because all these corporations out there had nowhere else to spend their money except for hiring and expanding. Ending. Well, they're coming to an end now and those guys are going to start going bankrupt and you're going to start seeing the unemployment rising and rising dramatically. Once that starts to take place, it's going to be very painful throughout the rest of the economy because there's not going to be a whole lot of consuming happening during that. All right. Uh, what would, what window guidance, how the Japanese do it, ever work in the U.S. model? Uh, I'm not sure. Media is always opposite, and I don't think this is any different. You know, will banking system collapse when this small group decide? I don't know. I don't think they're going to allow the banking system to collapse. Like, if they allowed it to collapse, that would be like a loss of control, and the last thing they want to do is lose control. I think really what they are going to do is get the interest rate. The Federal Reserve is going to lift interest rates up to around that 5%. They're going to get their ammo back, right, because the Fed funds rate is their ammunition when they want to stimulate the economy they drop that fed funds around five percent that'll get people out there borrowing money to stimulate the economy i don't know how effective this is going to be because they are lifting interest rates so fast so furiously that the impact that the lifting of interest rates is not yet affecting the economy now it affects the markets right away and a lot of people look at like the dow and think of that as the economy that's not the economy that's you know a handful of businesses out there the economy is our decisions on what we buy, the businesses we start, the decisions that we make with our money, like if we're going to go on vacation or save it or do something. That's the economy out there. And the interest rates and the lifting of interest rates or the dropping of interest rates takes time to actually move into the economy. So they're trying to hurry up and get those interest rates lifted as high as they can before the impact of lifting interest rates starts to really affect the economy and they have to reverse course. If they can get it up to that 5%, they might be able to put that perception out there that, hey, look, we're going to try and stimulate the economy by dropping the Fed funds rate. Ultimately, it's not going to work. They're going to hit zero again. They know that that's going to be they're, they're not going to have like the pandemic to stimulate the economy with like here. Everybody stay home. Don't go to work. Don't pay your rents. And here's a check to, you know, to go and wipe out the inventory levels with. They're, they're not going to have that same thing going on. So it's going to be like a sovereign corporate debt crisis. It's going to be like a financial crisis taking place. 
And what they're going to do is probably, in my opinion, move into the digital currencies at that time. You'll see the central bank digital currencies start to rise and everything getting tokenized, all commodities, all labor, all service, all that stuff is all going to get end up and end up on a blockchain digital technology type of transactions where everything will get tracked and traced. Now, that transition is not going to happen like right away. It's going to take a while, but what they're going to pretty much do it with the food. In my opinion, they'll do it with food. And you can already see like how expensive food is becoming. And if you read the issues that are taking place around the world, there's going to be a worldwide food shortage. I I don't know how to explain that to people anymore. It's just like you got to get prepared. The United States grows a lot of food, right? So it's not the United States that's going to be out of food. We're going to have food here. It's just going to be so damn expensive because the rest of the world is going to run out and they will be paying top dollar for it. And that's going to cause the prices here in the United States to go up as well. So all this stuff we have to be prepared for because it's coming, right? There is going, the next crisis, there is always going to be a currency crisis coming. There is always a recession. This country has gone through countless recessions. It's like one every seven to 12 years and the country has been through like 12 depressions i mean it's like there's zero doubt in our minds that there is going to be some sort of shifting change to the way things are if there's a booming economy there will be a busting economy at some point and the next one is going to be incredibly intense because of the position that we are in there is no real way for the federal reserve and the government to stimulate this economy without either massive government spending of some sort or taking interest rates into negative territory and removing cash out of the system and forcing us to spend our money all right that's going to be the way it goes down wow right on 316 of you up in here well 313 go hit that like button we still got another I'm going to probably give it another 15, 20 minutes out here and, you know, we can still get a bunch of comments and, uh, and questions answered here. What is your prediction for the jobs market in the Pacific Northwest in 2030? And I, I man, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't tell you what, what it's going to be like in, in 10 years from now. I mean, if you're thinking of like what kind of career positions to go into, I think over the next 10 years that the service industry, like, um, let me think, the assisted living, right? Something that have to do with that because there's going to be a much older population that does not have enough younger population to take care of them, right? There's a much bigger, older demographics of people and the younger generations are just not enough of them in that sense that is going to take care of all these people. So there's going to be need for assisted livings, right? There's not enough families, there's not enough people, there's just not enough, right? So that's gonna be where I think the major jobs are gonna, like, how could I say, like the consistent, a lot of jobs because there's just gonna need, be a need for that. Um, there's gonna be other needs out there too, but if there was one that, I think that's gonna be it, you know? Um, not that I would wanna do that, but there's plenty of people who find a lot of pleasure and satisfaction out of that all right what happens if there is a hundred basis point hike i don't know the markets freak out about it you know they it's a lot of it is market perception too right i mean you think about it like the market started reacting to the federal reserve's initial idea of lifting of interest rates when they said hey at the next you know meeting we're going to lift interest rates well the markets started reacting right away to that and then people took on the idea that the markets are like disconnected from the federal reserve because they started reacting before the federal reserve lifted interest rates yeah it's because it was job owning it was forward guidance it was credible threats i mean the markets are going to react to the fed's news there was a time when the fed used to be very quiet about what they were going to do they hardly let anybody know and then when Greenspan came out and made a statement. Everybody just tried to decipher exactly what the hell it meant. Nobody, the Fed was never as vocal as they are today. They really tried to guide the markets and, and get them to react to their to their words before they actually do their actions. I can't see how people will have enough saved for assisted living. There is, there is plenty in the baby boomer population who are ready to, they have sitting on a lot of assets. Uh, scratchy next round of stimulus should be to unvax to lost their jobs yeah you know I agree like this whole like what happened to 
What happened, man? Like, where the hell did everybody go? I don't get this, man. I mean, there were so many people who were saying out there that if you don't wear a mask and you don't get vaccinated, that you're making little babies die and shit. Like, I, where is everybody? You know, what happened to all the people who, like, showed up at their job every single day during that thing, didn't complain about anything, did their did what they were supposed to do while other people were lazy asses collecting unemployment and enhanced unemployment and didn't pay their rent and didn't pay their stuff. I mean, what happened to all the people who stuck it out through the whole thing and continued on with their lives as if everything was normal? Nothing. They got nothing for it, right? For behaving like a normal person. Sick. Thank you, Scratchy, for bringing that up. <laughs> uh, do you think pharma health care sector, best sector that will survive recession? I, I don't know, like, I don't know what sector of the economy is going to do really well during the recession. Um, there's going to be major need for health care because, of that, again, that older population is going to demand it. So, yeah, I mean, I guess that would be a good sector to be in if you think about it from that kind of that kind of view. You know? All right. Lots of companies are predicting a 50 basis point hike in December. I hope they surprise with 100. We need to remove bad debt from the system. Yeah. Um, it's well, you're going to get what you want. The the bad, the the clearing out of the malinvestment, that's coming. I mean, you give it a couple of years and we're going to be like, it's going to be reports of bankruptcies and defaults and insolvency and failing countries and corporations. It's going to be bad. It's going to be ugly, 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 you know, and how this goes down. Um, but I'm looking, actually looking forward to the other side of that because the rebuild from that ought to be pretty cool. Um, at least in my opinion, you know, it ought to give a lot of room for investment. If you can like hunker down and get through this without losing everything, losing your shirt, on the other side of it, it's going to be a great place to invest in, at least in my opinion. Now, I know a lot of people are probably going to hold, argue with the whole idea of central bank digital currencies and stuff, but it's going to create a whole new way of investing. I couldn't tell you exactly what that looks like because I'm not really an investor and can't really imagine or dream up what these things or these ideas are going to look like. But I just know that the more we pay attention to it, intuitively, we should be able to make the right decision when that comes. All right. Good call ermav chaos and opportunity uh, 75 basis points is the best do you feel the pain ue i don't feel the pain i see the pain coming and i've talked about it for quite some time now here's the thing about understanding it and seeing it coming is that you don't make decisions in your life that would cause you to feel pain right now if i went out and bought me the new car and the or the new truck or something that i really wanted to that pain would be a lot more intense right but because i decided to stick with my 99 toyota corolla i don't have to feel the pain of buying or having a new car payment and that's the pain that's going to be coming because the lack of income coming in, the lack of being able to do business, the lack of transactions, that's coming soon. And if you're not prepared for it, it's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough to deal with. Right on. 400 of you up in here. This is great. I'll give it another. Let's see. It's 23. I need it. Uh, see, I'm trying to keep timing on it. Oh, I could probably do at least 15 minutes from now. Uh, Nordic pipeline damage, economic impact. Yeah. Again, like. You know, these individual, they, they, although they're major, they're isolated, right? It's not like the macro impact of the economy. Yes, it can spread and it can create issues and stuff like that. But it's not like, you know, like the Ukraine war is a major impact to the economy. But even once that ends, the economy then starts to continue on, you know, with that as far as part of it. It's not like the Ukraine war changes the economy. The Ukraine war is happening because of the economy, right? I mean, politics act the way they do because of the economy. It's it's not vice versa from that. And a lot of, it's hard for people because people who are so involved with politics will disagree with that, but they are wrong. I, I guarantee you they are definitely wrong. You will never learn more about economics until you give up on politics. Once you give up on politics, the floodgates of economic knowledge just start really opening up. And think about it. like. Most of the hardcore economists out there don't really make their predictions off of what happens from politics, like the, you know their economic decisions and stuff like that. If they do, they're not they're not the greatest 
I mean, in my opinion, they're not really that great of economists. They don't really give that great of information. Now, they could give an opinion and one that sounds great and entertaining and probably has a lot of like, you know, thinking, you know, value to it or something like that. But if you really want to know the direction, the flow of money, how people are going to behave and stuff like that, get politics out of it. Just get out of it. You can talk about Bitcoin versus CBDC. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, again, like the central bank digital currency, in my opinion, is not the same as the cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin is completely separated. It's outside of the banking system. It's outside of government control. It like, I mean, I love it because people are like, oh, man, if it ever gets to that point, they'll just make it illegal. Well, that's fine. But you'd have to make it illegal in every single country, in every single jurisdiction, everywhere, with every computer. I mean, it's not happening, right? I mean, it could. It's not. It's not going to happen. So even if you want to make it illegal in this country, all the rest of the world is still cool with it. And considering that if you make a Bitcoin transaction, if you initiate one, there is nobody or nothing that's going to stop that from happening. Now, you know, there are governments and people who might be able to see that transaction and know that you have done it, but they can't stop you from doing it. And that is pretty cool. I mean, that's pretty nice about Bitcoin. Central bank digital currencies are nothing more than trying to track you keep keep track of you to make sure you pay your taxes to make sure you're not you know uh, behaving in illegal ways or whatever and it's about taking interest rates negative because they have to get cash out of the system and they cannot have cash in the system with the negative interest rates because people would then pull their money out of the banking system and put it in the mattress and that right there would end the banking system as we know it so they know that they have to keep people's money in the banking system and there's no way of keeping money in the banking system while taking interest rates into negative territory on a serious basis like they've done negative interest rates before but not onto a serious level where like savings accounts are in negative territory and stuff like that their only way they can do it is by going cashless and having that central bank digital currency. It's, it was something that the IMF or the Bureau of International Settlements was talking about a very long time ago. I did a video on this before they were calling out the central bank digital currencies and talking about this exact thing, the e-currency and how to take interest rates into negative and how to get cash out of the system. Because once they have the central bank digital currency in hand, like in, in we're using it, then what they can do is start charging a fee for the cash. You want to deposit cash, you want to withdraw cash, they're going to charge a fee. And that fee will be the equivalent of the negative interest rates that it's applied to your bank account. So no matter what you do, you are not going to be able to have any kind of benefit from holding cash. That's how they're going to get the cash out of the system. So everybody will put their cash into the bank, have the central bank digital currencies, and then transfer it into anything else but the savings, right? They'll buy They'll buy stuff, they'll buy investments, they will do anything they can to keep from having that negative interest rates. But this is the way that the can the the banking system can now stimulate the economy because if you have a central bank digital currency, now you have all kinds of ways that you can stimulate the economy. You can inject it right into the people's wallets and tell them you have 30 days to spend that or else it's going to disappear. And then you can't spend it on drugs or guns or alcohol or tobacco or anything else. You have to spend it at restaurants or on food or on utilities. You know, they have they can make it so you have a particular direction and a time timeline in which that you have to spend it so that can stimulate the economy and they can do it in a particular direction and they can like force feed it in in that way kind of cool really when you think about it i mean i don't think it's fun or a good idea but i mean that's kind of neat how they are able to come up with this idea you know Ooh, what's next uh, hey thank you so much guys for the super chat i really appreciate that uh christina for this super sticker 99 cents thank you very much all right, this economy is circling the drain like the log uh, I dropped this morning. Ew. Yeah, that's pretty gross, bro. All right. Um, if the BTC were made unlawful by the U.S., it would drop in price before the moonshot. I don't know, all-nighter. I, I have to kind of disagree with that one a little bit. I think the initial reaction would be very much that. But think about anything that somebody wants that they make illegal. Alcohol. Well, they don't really make alcohol illegal. Drugs, sex, guns, 
anytime they take something that somebody wants and they make it illegal, the, the price of it goes through the roof. So I have a feeling that if they try to make BTC illegal, although the initial idea is like, oh crap, got to get out of this, the people really want it and it's illegal. Oh yeah, now it's time, right? It's going to figure out a way to use it, have it, and the price of it will go through the roof. And I know like, you know, the whole idea, you know, they just can't get it through the exchange or something like that and get it in the cash position. Again, take something that somebody wants, make it illegal, watch the price go up. And, all right, I like how this guy's driving an absolute old beater, but talking this glorious information. <laughs> yeah, thank you, man. Well, you know, when, when you're stuck in survival mode until you're 40 years old and you realize, man, I need to do something very different from what it was, Pretty soon, like, the idea of owning, like, a new car is not nearly as important as achieving a million dollars in asset investments kind of thing, right? Like, you want to be rich? Drive a POS. Like, that's that's what it comes down to. I watched this kid jump into a $70,000 truck the other day at the grocery store, and I'm thinking, bro, do you have any idea on how much money you would have if you were to take those payments, the insurance, the gas, all that other stuff, and put it into investments and drive something like this instead, do you realize how much money you would have at the end of the game? Like it would be, I, I mean, I don't have a compounding interest calculator right now, but for this kid was probably 25 years old, right? I don't know how the hell he ended up with this truck, but you know, I don't know, I guess it could have been his dad's too. Anyhow, I, I'm just thinking like, man, that was the type of sh stuff that I did when I was his age. And that's the reason why I'm in the condition that I went in. I mean, thank God I figured this stuff out, but it like, it didn't come easy. And I mean, to be honest with you, I feel very fortunate to have what I have going on in my life right now. All right, nice, 487 of you. All right, I'm gonna stay for another 10 minutes or so. For the record, I don't think the U.S. will try to make BTC illegal. Um, I don't think they will either. I mean, I think they might put a bunch of laws and try to regulate it a bunch of ways, but I don't think they'll make it illegal. Yeah, mommy and Daddy probably bought him the truck. Yeah, probably. Gas stations are now selling cannabis. Well, the gas stations all around here sell CBD. I mean, they have for a long time. And there's more dispensaries in Astoria than there's just about anything. I mean, you know, Oregon was already, like, there, it, weed was never illegal in Oregon. I, I don't know if a lot of people know that. The possession of less than an ounce, and it wasn't packaged up for distribution. If you had a possession of an ounce or less of weed, you paid, I think it was a $600 misdemeanor fine. It was confiscated, and you went on your way, right? So long as you weren't driving or selling, it was cool. Nobody gave a shit about weed. And like still today, nobody cares. Like Oregonians do not care about weed. And it practically spills out on the ground around here. Uh, it's just like, you know, they sell CBD at all the grocery stores, every stand, every everywhere you see it. It's constant. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much, Bambi, for the $4.99 super sticker. Very nice of you. All right, poor man's investing. Your name says it all, man. Buy XRP or stay poor. Yep, up to you. I mean, everybody has their has their has their horse they're riding, man. I mean, get it. driving by the definition of the state means doing direct commerce with the state. If you're not doing biz with the state, you're merely driving via automobile. Hmm. It's an interesting thought there, All Nighter. All right. Hey, hello, all the way from South Africa. Well, thank you very much, Cyborg. Hello back. My house has lost 140000 from the beginning of the year. How about yours, Mr. Economist? Mine, I don't want to brag, but mine is up $92,000 since I bought it almost one year ago, right now. Then that's scary as shit. Like, I am not impressed with that at all. So, um, I, I mean, I would like to say like, Woo, that's so rad. It's not, it's, it's a very troubling, troubling sign for me. All right. Calling seven on the dice. 
UK's prime minister didn't last long. <laughs> no, I, I read the high, uh, the headlines on that, that she already resigned. I was quick. Uh, uh, this guy seems legit. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, I mean, that's up to your guys' decision on it. I just come out here and try to be me doing the things that I do. Have you looked into BRICS? Like the BRICS nation? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa? Absolutely, I have. Um, the BRICS nations are definitely a growing... Um, is it going to be a growing movement as far as like the competition with the current swift system and what we have um there's very little doubt in my mind that's going to continue to grow now as far as right now being any kind of major concern for me i don't have that like there is nothing out there that even remotely comes close to competing with the us dollar like nothing and so even if you were to take like the transactions that are even occurring now like even the buildup of everything that has happened like hey we're going to try and move into this you know outside of the swiss system saudi arabia is going to start doing you know deals with you know inside of the brics nations or whatever even still with all that going on it still is so insignificant to what the dollar is doing right now is the dollar eventually going to fade away or even just be abandoned from being used as a world reserve currency? Yes, absolutely. Definitely going to happen at some point in, in time, but not tomorrow. And it's not going to happen the next day. In fact, it's going to continue to get worse as far as the dollar strengthening around the world. And as that happens, you're going to find where even more nations, corporations, entities around the world are going to try and get out of the dollar because of that strengthening that's happening. It's become too burdensome, too burdensome for them to try and do those deals with and then to have like these sanctions and all that other stuff brought on it. But at the end of the day, what does everybody want? US dollars, guaranteed, right? At, they are going to buy their commodities with it. They are going to buy their food with it. They are going to be using US dollars to do the world transactions with and that is not going to change anytime soon. So investing in the BRICS nation, yeah, maybe for the long haul for your kids or something like that, maybe out there a long ways, but not for the next couple of years. I mean, I don't see any place personally, and I don't try to tell you guys how to invest, but right now, I don't see any other place that I would rather be than the U.S. dollar, cash, straight up, right? And it's only because everything is going to collapse. The Federal Reserve is going to reel in this money. They're going into quantitative tightening. The interest rates are going to stay up. People are not going to be encouraged into investing into this thing as that happens, and that is going to tighten up everything. So being in cash is going to be the position that you want to be as you watch people who have overextended themselves into debt have to start selling off everything that they love in order to pay their debts back and you're going to be able to pick up those things at an incredibly cheap price and that's where you're going to want to be in that cash position so. all right guys it's getting closer and closer to the end of my lunch time here we're at 37 minutes i'm going to give it like five more minutes here gig driver dollar 99 thank you uh any thoughts on buying uk real estate um i'm nervous about the real estate right now like i said i mean this the other person the other commenter lost a hundred thousand dollars on their house my house has gone up a hundred thousand dollars in the meantime that is a very imbalanced market and that does not provide me with like the assurance that it's like yeah i'm confident with putting my money into real estate I'm not there, right? There's other people who would be like, no, dude, that's the time, get in, right? I, I don't feel it, right? I don't feel that. If you are finding a rental property that you're investing in and the property seems like it's a good value, now that might be a different story because rent, rent still, excuse me, guys, rent, rental income still seems to be a fairly decent market right now. Now, I would be concerned about that if unemployment rises because that's your rent, right? So um, if it's a rental income, I, I think I would be a little bit more like on board with something like that. But right now I'm not into real estate at all. Like, I mean, not, not seriously. Hey, Christina, thank you so much for the $5. I uh, love your channel. Thank you. If 10 year keeps going up, how does the debt to GDP being worse than in 2008 affect things? What could break? Um, I don't, I, I don't know like what that could look like. Um, if it does continue, we are going to continue to have issues with like the financial market and the lending of money going out there to the rest of the world. 
or at least into the country, if you don't lend money out there, people aren't spending money and then the GDP, that's the gross domestic profit, basically is people doing transactions. There's gonna be less transactions, there's gonna be pain. How, like, I mean, are they going to force a bankruptcy within the treasuries or the Fed or something like that? I guess they could. Like, I, I just don't see something like that happening. Like, I think that they could bring it to the brink that everybody would believe that and then they would have this unusual and exigent circumstance to bring out this other tool. I, I don't know what's going to happen when that when that takes place. I just see kind of like the flow and the direction of money. I see the tightening of the monetary policy. I see people starting to have to make some pretty tough decisions on whether or not they eat or pay their debts and because it's going to get quite expensive in there and like that. I wish I could answer that question a little better for you, Christina, but um, that's kind of what I'm, I guess I'm getting at is that with the slowdown of the economy, I can't imagine like, I can't imagine a scenario in which that any of those numbers look like they're going to be healthy. But again, like once you get to the point of bankruptcy, that's an unusual and exigent circumstance. And I couldn't tell you what's going to what what tools they have to deal with that. Um, I think that's when we're going to start seeing like a central bank digital currency introductions and stuff like that. It's going to be during a financial crisis. And it seems like they're leading us towards one. Like, I mean, doesn't that seem to be the case? Like, I mean, let's start with the corporations and then start moving into governments, people as well. And once all the bad debt is cleared out, then they'll have the solution for us. All right, 41 minutes into this. Okay, exactly, Mike, a store of wealth, not an investment, 100%. Uh, I'm not sure what they were talking about. Okay, let's get down here. New car repos are up. People thought stimmy, childcare, and enhanced unemployment checks were forever. Yeah, um, I, I know, right? I mean, there was some people who took advantage of it and probably invested that money, but everybody went hog wild. They're like, woohoo, free money. And nothing is free. Nothing in free life is free. So, I mean, I've kind of used this analogy before. Like, to me, the lowering of interest rates is like the seed, sowing of the seeds, right? You know, you, you put out all these, like, ideas. You put out this uh, available interest, you know, that people would want to take on. And so as people take on this interest, like this debt, right? And they have low interest payments. And so now they can invest into businesses or building, you know, new houses or something like that. And so with these low interest rates, they're out there like kind of seeding the garden and growing the garden. And then as the interest rates continue to drop or stay low, more and more people continue to build this garden up, building these houses and businesses and building all this stuff. And then eventually it gets to the point where the garden is so full and beautiful and it's just like overheated and awesome. And then they raise the interest rates and then the people, the gardeners and all the people who grew all that stuff and built it all, well, they can't afford to stay there anymore. And then the rich come in and harvest. They cut it all down and they take all the best parts for themselves. All this great stuff that everybody built off of debt. They come in and buy it up for pennies on the dollar while everybody else goes into default and, you know, bankruptcy and stuff. And then that's like the harvest season. Everything looks like hell and everything's damaged and looks like shit. And then you clear it all out and sow the seeds again by dropping the interest rates. I mean, doesn't that seem the way it is? It's kind of like the rich are harvesting the poor's efforts, right, by doing this. One more question, guys, and then I got to go. Great stuff, UE. Have a great day, crew. Thank you, Jaws. Very much appreciate that. Very cool of you. Uh, let's see. Flexing four built my tiny home for less than seven thousand. Wow, that's awesome. All right, people bought homes when they thought interest rates would stay near zero. What a trap to walk into. Yeah, um, I mean, I was there. I did the exact same thing, but so far so good for me. And I don't expect this. I mean, like I said, the house price went up so damn much. I don't expect that to last. But and then again, I was also like unfortunate but fortunate that I had that foreclosure in my past and they made me put 10% down on my house so it was just like a crazy amount so then the chances of me going underwater are pretty slim at this point all right moving on uh from uneducated economist my choice is going for global economic collapse yeah I think it's going to as well lone oak great job thank you very much sir. I appreciate that all right we got one more question and then I'm gonna jet all right 
okay, the broad majority agreed with Stimmy. Once the broad majority joins into crypto, why not raise the circulating supply? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Did your mortgage every month went up a lot, Simon? Did your mortgage every month went up a lot? Well, my, I mean, it's fixed, so I don't have any change to it. It's the same price, so, yeah. Have a good day, UE. You as well, Polar Man. All right, good day, UE. Please tell us about the tiny home bill for 7K. Yeah, maybe we could. We should have an all-nighter on. We should interview all-nighter because he's a fucking cool guy. But uh, I'm sorry, guys. I got to stop cussing. I apologize. And he could tell us about a $7,000 home that he built. All right, how to create a Federal Reserve, build the unsinkable Titanic, then invite those who are opposed to centralized banking, also run the Titanic into the iceberg. <laughs> awesome. All right, that would be cool. Yeah, it would be cool, All Nighter. Um, it would be awesome. Actually, just talking with you again would be a great time. So, All right, cannabis stocks, absolutely not. Stay away from cannabis. Don't buy it. I mean, unless you're planning on smoking it yourself, but don't buy it to invest in. It's not a good investment. It's just a damn weed. Anybody can grow it. All right. Uneducated economist. You guys let me know.